So let's start. First, I should say that I said, of course, at least one thing stupid last week, which was that, I mean, the transition between uh, liquid and vapor is, of course, discontinuous, as you can see in your, uh, when you are <laughs> boiling water. Uh, if you want something continuous, you rather, I mean, look at, for instance, the transition between uh, ferromagnet and, uh, I mean, loss of, uh, of uh, magnetization for a magnet which we will actually prove it's uh, continuous in this class. I mean, at least for a model of it. So we are in chapter two. And the goal of this chapter is to give you a glimpse at, at the theory of Bernoulli percolation. <coughs> and if you don't like the proof in this part, then really it's because of me. Because I think that's one of these uh, theories that started, you know, you had all these open problems. They remain open for a very long time. Then they were solved by very, very difficult proofs that were later simplified in difficult proof, which become like, OK, proofs. And now they are very easy. So if you don't understand, it's because of me. Ask me more questions, because I think that this is really a bunch of proofs that are very sharp and very nice. So Bernoulli percolation, you take P in 0, 1, and you take uh, the probability of a configuration to be just a product measure. So it's a product measure on 0, 1 to the edges. So here, I mean, contrary to last week, we can definitely construct the measure in infinite volume, so why not doing it, OK? So it's a product measure on this, where each is, is open with core ATP. OK, and my goal is in, in this chapter is not to make you know, a comprehensive theory of this thing. You, you have books, entire books on, uh, on uh, the theory of Bernoulli percolation. My goal is to give you a few archetypical results and some proof for this result that later on we are uh, going to try to generalize to more general model, model with dependency. OK, so it's really with a special emphasis on that. And the first thing I want to describe is what I'm going to call properties like of increasing uh, uh, with respect to increasing functions. So it's, uh, let's say, uh, increasing. Properties of percolation. So 0, 1 to the power edges of, of ZD can be ordered, partially ordered, in a trivial way that omega is smaller than omega prime if omega E is smaller or equal to omega prime E for every edge in ZD. OK? And with respect to this order on configuration, you, uh, you can actually construct an order on both events and functions. So a function f is increasing. Uh, uh, is increasing if, of course, what you think happen and an event A is increasing if its indicator function is increasing. OK? And in this case, you see that A is increasing is really equivalent to the fact that if omega is in A, then a, then, then any, in, I mean, larger configuration is in A. So omega in A imply, I mean, and so that's all the events that are stable by adding open edges, by turning closed edges to open. OK, so very simple definition. Now, I mean, there are many properties of percolation which are nice with respect to this event. 
So the first one is the monotonicity. which says the following. For any A increasing and any P smaller or equal to P prime, the probability of A is going to be smaller or equal to the probability of A for P prime. Probability for P is smaller than probability for P prime. Which is basically telling you the, the larger the P, the more open edges you have. So there is, I mean, I don't mind too much, but if you come in class, if you could avoid sleeping in it, that would be good. Thank you. You don't need to come in class, but if you come, you don't sleep. OK, so this is true for any increasing event. And um, you are going to see here it's going to be very simple to prove. But in general, it may be more difficult. And in fact, we are going to see that for random cluster models, this is going to be a much more delicate property to prove. And we do that as follows. In this case, we are going to construct a coupling between the two measures. As, so you can do the following. For any edge E in uh, ZD, just consider a uniform random variable on 0, 1. Independent, so the UE are independent. Independent and, I mean, and IID. So independent and identically distributed like that. Now you can define omega P of E to be simply 1 if UE is smaller or equal to P and 0 otherwise. So if you do that, well, you didn't do much. The omega p of e is just a Bernoulli random variable of parameter p, right? But what you did here is a little bit more subtle than that. What you did is that you constructed a huge probability space where, in fact, all this omega p, all this configuration lives together. They all live together in this huge probability space. But because they live in the same probability space, you can compare them. And in particular here, you see that whatever E and whatever P smaller or equal to P prime, omega P of E is smaller or, omega, smaller or equal to omega E of P prime. If you take, for instance, you have other ways of constructing two configurations in the same probability space. You can just take them independently. You take a probability space where you have pairs of configuration. You put them independently there. There is no reason that you will have this property because with probability 1 over p, I mean p times 1 minus p prime, you will have the small one which is open and the large one which is closed. Right? But here, you construct it differently in such a way that it's increasing. But now, so let's, let's say that p is the law of, I mean, of all these guys the common law of everybody, I mean, the law uh, of probability on this large probability space, then the probability of an event A is what? Well, it's just the probability under this huge law of omega p belongs to A, right? Because it's just, when I look at that, I just look at the PP is the law of this guy, so I get exactly this equality. But now, this implies that omega P prime is in A, simply because if omega P is in A, because omega P prime is larger than omega P, it's also in A. And this is exactly the probability at P prime of A. So once you have this increasing coupling, it's very, very quick to deduce increasing properties of, of uh, I mean, monotonicity of the measure. You're going to see next week, or maybe the week after, that this is a completely different matter. Of, I mean, it's not at all the same difficulty for more general measures. It can be very, very difficult to find such a coupling, to construct it. But here it's easy. Second property I want to discuss is uh, the Harris, or here I'm going to call the FKG, 
inequality. So it's also called Iris. And it says the following, for any p and for any a and b increasing, the probability of a intersected with b is larger or equal to the probability of a times the probability of b. Which, if you think about it, just divide by this term on both sides, you get the probability of a knowing b is larger or equal to the probability of a. So think of an event B as an event that lacks open edges, right? If it occurs because it's something which is, because it has this property of, increase, of being increasing, it basically, what, what are the typical examples of increasing events? No existence of an open path between two points, the fact that this edge is open, the fact that you have more than half the edges that are open, things like that. These are open, uh, open uh, events, uh, increasing events. So they lack open edges. So if you condition on B, it's basically you are already pushing your event, your uh, configuration to have more open edges than it should. So these open edges are going to help the occurrence of A. So this is a n very, very natural and intuitive um, inequality. The probability of A knowing B is larger or equal to the probability of A. And the proof, well, the proof in the case of percolation is just you do it first for events depending on finitely many edges simply by doing an induction on the number of edges on which it depends. And then you pass to the infinite volume by using just some abstract argument using Martin Gels, for instance, or some abstract argument using the fact that any increasing event, whatever the increasing event, is in fact you can approximate by increasing events depending on finitely many edges. And this is just due to the fact that maybe actually I didn't even tell you that. What is the set of just measurable events here? Well, that's the smallest sigma algebra which is generated by events depending on finitely many edges. So by definition, any event is going to be approximated by events which depend on finitely many edges. So you just use that to conclude. I'm not going to prove this thing, first because the proof is very simple, it's really just an induction, you can try to do it yourself. And second, because we are going to do much better in the next class. We are going to prove, in fact, I mean, necessary and su I mean, sufficient, at least, uh, criteria to uh, get the FKG inequality for a large class of models. So there it will make much more sense to spend a little bit of time proving these guys. So here I'm going to skip this proof. Okay, um, third property. So this one is going to be very, very useful to compare uh, the fact that, I mean, combination of events, to, to try to estimate the probability of combination, uh, combination of events. And it's going to be always with uh, larger or equal. So one natural thing is to try to get the opposite inequality. When can we get the opposite inequality? Well, obviously, if A and B depends on different set of edges, then by independence, you know that the probability of A inter intersected with B is equal to the product. In general, you, I mean, it's not so interesting to deal with guys that are not depending on the same set of edges. So here, uh, what we will use is an I mean, a notion which is a little bit refined compared to that. So this is called the BK inequality. The BK inequality is the following. If I give you two events, so I need a definition before. So let A and B be two increasing events. So we say that uh, A disjoint occurrence B if the following occurs. If so, uh, we say that uh, is a set of configurations such that, so omega belongs to A disjoint occurs B if there exist two sets, E and F 
included in the edges of the D, which are disjoint. Okay. This set they can depend here, I mean they can depend on the configuration. I mean they do depend on the configuration in general. Such that omega, I mean such that any configuration omega bar coinciding with omega on E belongs to A. And any configuration omega bar prime corresponding with omega prime on F belongs to B. So what does it mean? It means if I look at the configuration omega just on E, uh, there is no omega prime, sorry, on, on omega on F. If I look at the configuration omega on E, just on E, I already know that omega is in A. I don't need to have any information on the state of the edges outside E. I have this other set F, and just looking at these edges, I know already whether omega is in B or not. Okay? So for instance, what is the difference if I take A to be the event 0, connected to infinity, and B is the same event, zero connected to infinity. What is the difference between, between A intersected with B and A disjoint occurrence B? So A intersected with B, it's easy, just A, right? I'm intersecting both events. So it's the existence of a path from zero to infinity. A disjoint occurrence B, is different, right? Because here, I need first, I need two sets E and F, such that if I look at E, I already know that zero is connected to infinity. And if I look at F, which is disjoint from E, I already know that zero is connected to infinity. So the disjoint occurrence of these two guys is what? Is the existence of two disjoint paths going to infinity. So here it's existence of two disjoint paths, pass to infinity. OK, so this is the definition. And notice that if A and B are independent, uh, are depending really, I mean, if E and F are just deterministic, not depending on omega, then you, I mean, you basically just have the intersection. So if A and B are events which a priori depend on completely different set of edges to start with, then the, the disjoint occurrence is just the intersection. But what we are, we are allowing the two sets to depend on the same set of edges, they just need to have this kind of witness which are disjoint. There is no on the, the, the EMF that so, can be yeah, they can be infinite, yeah. I mean, most, uh, actually, I mean, you are going to see in the inequality they cannot, but a priori in the definition here they could. So now the BK inequality is the following. It says, if A and B are increasing and uh, depending on finitely many edges, then the probability of A circle B is less or equal this time to the product of the probability. So this is a BK inequality. Um, the intuition here is that, well, the occurrence of A is removing space for the occurrence of B. B cannot use the edges that were used for A. And if you think like that, then it's really not clear at all why I'm assuming that A is increasing, right? I mean, then for A and B non-increasing, that should still be true. That if I need some space to make A occur, then B should, uh, should have less probability to occur. And that's exactly true. So in fact, here, there is an improvement due to Reimer 
which says that you can take A and B uh, arbitrary. Still depending on finitely many edges, but arbitrary. You don't need them to be increasing. So the proof of the BK inequality is, to say the least, a little bit obscure. Excuse me, what does it mean exactly? It depends on the finite many edges. So, so that means that they are already to start with a set of a finite set of edges on which you know that A and B depends only on the random variable omega E for E in this set of edges. Yeah. Yes? Is it simply not true if A and B depend on so it, they, they are actually, I never really thought about the counter examples, but you may have problem at infinity or, uh, I mean, you, you, you may have events that do not work. I mean, do you know a, a counter example? There are counter examples, but they are silly. So basically any event that you are going to really consider, so all the time almost, the events a and B, if they depend on infinitely many edges, you can approximate them trivially by, by events that depend on finitely many edges. If you take zero connected to infinity, you can just take zero connected to distance n, and then let n goes to infinity. What is not clear is that if you take A, n, and B, n, depending on finitely many edges like that, approximating A and B, that A, n circle B, n is actually approximative th this guy. So for zero connected to infinity, it's clear that here it's going to become just the existence of two paths going to distance n, which is going to converge to the existence of two paths going to infinity. But a priori, it's not completely clear. Yeah, so that's, um, that's a very good question. OK, so this BK inequality, the proof is, is really not really, uh, I mean, you don't see what you are doing. It's the Reimer inequality is even worse. But the beauty is that, in fact, uh, contrary to what people think, the immense majority of the theorem you will prove on percolation do not use the BK inequality. People use it all the time, but in fact, you always use a simpler property. So I'm not going to prove that, and I'm going to use a simpler property like that. We avoid ourselves a little bit of trouble. Okay? And just to be pedagogical, in the exercise session that I gave you, I gave you maybe the only example I know almost where it really uses the BK inequality, and you cannot get over it. But, um, so that was a BK inequality. Last thing that I want, last property that I want, and uh, so we are going to always try to get these properties for more general models. See what we can do with that. So the last property is going to be just how do we differentiate? How do we see how the probability of an event evolves with P? So this is called Rousseau's formula. And it says the following. So the same thing, I need a definition. For an edge, E is uh, pivotal for the configuration. So let's A be increasing. Pivotal for the configuration uh, omega if the following occurs. If omega E belongs to A and omega E doesn't belong to A. So what are these two guys? Omega E is a configuration which coincides with A, except that the edge E is open. The configuration coinciding with A, uh, with omega, except that E is open. And same thing, omega with the E at the bottom is the same thing with closed. So one of these two configurations is equal to omega, but the other one is just omega, but I switch the state of the edge at E. OK? So what we are saying here, I mean, I guess the name is fairly uh, intuitive. We are saying that the edge E by itself is going to decide whether omega is in the event or not. Okay? And because it's an increasing event, the only possibility is that maybe when it's open, it's in A, and when it's closed, it's not in A, right? So for instance, if I take, let's take 0, and let's take the event that is connected to the boundary of a box. What is the probability that this edge, E, is pivotal? I mean, what is, sorry, what is the event that this edge, E, is pivotal for the, for the connectivity? 
Well, if this edge is open, I need to have a path. But if it's closed, I should not have a path. So that means that there must be some kind of surface, closed surface of edges, OK, which is encapsulating 0 and passing through E. But at the same time, when E is open, I need to have a path, right? So it should be that, in fact, the configuration is doing like that. So it goes through E. When E is open, I have a path. When E is closed, I have this dual surface, which is blocking the existence of a path. Dual surface of closed edges. So here, what I'm denoting by that is all the edges like that, they are all closed. OK? So this is the event. E is pivotal for, say, 0 connected to the boundary of the box. You can try to see what, uh, I mean, for instance, I don't know, the fact that there are more than half the edges which are open, what is the uh, probability that uh, an edge is pivotal for that? Now, Rousseau's formula is saying the following. For any event A and increasing, and for any P, the derivative of A is the sum over the edges in ZD, and, and sorry, A depending on finitely many edges. For any P, it's the sum of the probability of E pivotal for A. And let me try to prove that to you. So you see, it's fairly easy to estimate the derivative. You just need to estimate the probability of being pivotal, and you sum on all the edges. Rousseau's formula. OK, the derivative with respect to, so A depends on the edges in some set E, which is finite. OK. So the derivative on, um, the derivative on P is just the sum of the partial derivatives on each edge. Okay, just think for a moment that each edge has a different P, a PE associated to each edge. So let's say that instead we are, we are going to define this probability where in fact each edge is open with probability PE. So here, this guy is just a sum the sum over the edges of the derivative with respect to PE of this guy. OK? So I just want to isolate the, the, I mean, the contribution of one edge. OK, but now here, just look at plus epsilon. Uh, so let's say just move for the edge E, move from P to P plus epsilon, OK, for edge E. So PE give PE plus epsilon. E is fixed, OK? When I do OK, we understand what I mean by that. When I do this thing minus this, what is the only difference? The only difference is that the edge E was moved from P to P plus epsilon. So in, this, in the huge coupling, when I have all these independent random variables, I have that omega P plus epsilon belongs to A minus this big probability is that omega p belongs to a. You understand that epsilon here is just the vector which has one coordinate, which is epsilon at e and 0 otherwise. So here, because of the increasing property of the coupling, this is just the probability of omega p plus epsilon belong to a, but omega p doesn't belong to a. 
So here, what is the only possible difference between this configuration and this one? Well, they coincide on everybody except the edge E. So for this guy to belong to A and this guy not to belong to A, first the edge E has to be pivotal. If, the, if it doesn't matter regarding if you know already everybody else, if the edge E doesn't matter, then as soon as this guy is not in A, this guy is not going to be in A. As soon as this guy is in A, this guy is going to be in A. Okay, so here you need, there is no choice, we need omega p, I mean e, to be pivotal for omega p. Okay? But now, conditionally on being pivotal, notice that being pivotal doesn't depend on the value of the edge e for omega itself. Because anyway, you switch the state of the thing. Here, E is pivotal, I mean, doesn't depend on the state of the edge here. So the state of the edge is independent. So here it's open with probability P plus epsilon, here it's open with probability P. So the only difference here is that you are going to get an epsilon due to the fact that this is exactly the probability of being open at P plus epsilon, but closed at P. It's exactly that the uniform random variable that you had was between p and p plus epsilon to start with. You let epsilon tends to, so this is just probability of e pivotal for a times epsilon, and you just let epsilon tends to zero and you get your result. Okay. That means that you take the partial derivative because multiplying by epsilon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is really for this partial derivative. Yes, yes. I let you fill the details because I want, I want, I mean, somehow there is another way. You can also write, so alternative road if you prefer. You just write that the probability of A is the sum of all the configuration in A, P to the number of open edges in A, 1 minus P, so let's say 1 minus P to uh, the number of edges minus the number of open edges. So p to the number of open edges, 1 minus p to the number of closed edges. You differentiate that, you do a big, big mess with everything, and you are going to get the same result, of course. Okay, so here, there is nothing really conceptual. I like the proof by coupling, because it's a cute one, but otherwise you can just do brutally, and actually that's how we will do with the more general, uh, with the more general models. Okay, so this, were the basic properties regarding increasing events. So now we, are, uh, we have our weapons, we can start to fight. So two, what about the phase transition in this model? So here the phase transition is not exactly the same as for the spin models. It's going to be regarding the the existence of an infinite cluster or not. So the first theorem, which is now basically trivial, is that for any d larger or equal to 1, there exists a PC which depends on d, and which is between 0 and 1, such that um, theta of p d, which is the probability that 0 is connected to infinity um, in your random cross, in your percolation model, is going to be 0 if p is smaller than pc, and strictly positive if p is larger than pc. So this is the definition, and this is the theorem. Notice one thing, I mean, this theorem is completely trivial at this point. Why? Because this quantity is increasing. So just define PC as the supremum of the P for which this is equal to zero, period. So the only f content of this theorem is that it's increasing, um, that this thing is increasing. So of course, we are not going to stop here. Later on, and usually when people define, I mean, mention this theorem, what they do is that they, they write larger or equal to 2 here, and they want to prove that PC is actually strictly between 0 and 1. Otherwise, okay, at zero, the, at 0, there is no infinite cluster, that's clear. 
At one, there is an infinite cluster, that's clear. But the, the, really the existence of a transition is that there is actually a whole regime of P for which you don't have an infinite cluster. And there is a whole regime of P for which you do have an infinite cluster. The thing is that we are going to prove anyway, today probably it will be a little bit uh, too uh, short, but next time for sure, we are going to prove that PC of D equal 2 is 1 half, in fact. And uh, you can easily convince yourself, so this is going to tell you what is going to tell you that PC of D is always smaller or equal to 1 half, right? Because it's clear that if you already own Z2, if you have an infinite cluster, well, in the whole space, a fortiori, you do have one. So you will have that PC of D is always smaller or equal to PC of 2, which is 1 half. Now you can very easily, so this is a small exercise, you can prove that PC of D is larger than 1 over 2D. Does somebody know, as somebody who didn't see that before, can tell me quickly why this is true? So if you want to be connected to infinity, you need to be connected, then you need to have a path going from 0 to, I mean, of length n, right? What is the probability for a path, a fixed path, coming, going from 0 and going to this, I mean, of length n to be open? Well, it's p to the n, right? Every edge needs to be open. How many paths do you have like that? You have 2d to the n, at most. So just the union bound is going to tell you that the probability that there exists one of these paths which is open is going to be smaller than 2d to the n times p to the n. So if p times 2d is smaller than 1, this is tending to 0. So you always have this. This is, I mean, trivial, basically. And you will have, I mean, you have always that for d larger or equal to 2. And this we will prove later on that this is uh, proved later, that this is equal to 1 half. So I'm not going to spend time. There is another argument to prove that, which is called the Pearl's argument. But I'm not going to lose time doing it, because anyway, we will do much better later. OK. So this, is, this tells you that you have this phase transition. So usually, just for the vocabulary, we say that the P larger than PC phase is called the supercritical phase. And the P smaller than PC phase is the subcritical phase. Now it remains there is one phase that I didn't tell you anything about at, the, at this point, which is exactly the P equal PC phase. Okay? Notice that I was very careful, I hope, yeah, to put strict inequalities here. I didn't tell you what is happening exactly at PC. And remember that this is exactly what we want to understand. We want to understand whether we have continuous or discontinuous phase transitions. So at PC, this is where the thing is, becomes interesting. And at PC, we call the phase the critical phase. So P equals PC is called the critical phase. And we are going to see whether we can prove something on this critical phase. OK. There is one thing which. I mean, usually when people speak of phase transition, they like to see something really having a phase transition, like a discontinuity somewhere. Phase transition is what is a macroscopic change of your, pro I mean, a, pro a change in the macroscopic properties of your model, and a sharp change. Here, like this probability of being connected to infinity, I mean, in fact, I can already give you a as a prediction is that it's, uh, it's continued, uh, continuous at PC. So you know, it moves smoothly. So it doesn't. Um... But what happened is that what is changing drastically is just the existence of an infinite cluster. The fact that this infinite cluster passes through 0, this is going to change smoothly. But the existence of an infinite cluster, this probability is going to go from 0 to 1, in fact. And this is due to a property that is going to be very useful for us, which is called the ergodicity of the measure. So let me define that. So let's tau x to be, 
So for x in Zd, define tau x from the, vert from the edges of Zd into itself, which to an edge, omega, uh, to an edge AB gives you A plus x, B plus x. Give you the edge A plus x, B plus x. So if you have like that a translation on the edges, you deduce a translation on the configuration in a trivial way. So tau x of omega at E is going to be omega of tau x of E. OK? For every, so for every. So you have now a translation on the, uh, on the uh, configuration. And if you have a translation on the configuration, you can also have a translation on the events now by saying tau x of the event A is just a set of omega such that tau x of omega belongs to A. So notice it's a little bit strange because it, it reverses. Um, OK, so now. What do we do? We say that, uh, so definition, a measure on, or oh, let's, let's define it as a theorem right away. Theorem for any p in 0, 1, the percolation measure is ergodic, meaning that the probability that for any event A such that tau x of A equal A for any x, so these are translational invariant events, then the probability of A belongs to 0 or 1. So the only events that are invariant of the translation, their probabilities are 0 or 1, always. So let me prove that and give you a very simple corollary, and then we make a, we make a stop and break. So how do we do that? And I, I want to show you the proof because it's basically always like that that you prove ergodicity. So what you do, you observe that, I mean, if I can prove that the probability of A squared is equal to the probability of A, it exactly tells me that the probability of A is 0 or 1. So that's my goal. I want to prove that the square of the probability is equal to the probability. And I will do that like that. I would say, OK. Well, the probability of A, well, it's the probability of A intersected with A, and it is then nothing crazy. But A is invariant of the translation. So this is also equal to the probability of A intersected with tau x of A, OK, for any x. Imagine for a second that A would depend only on finitely many edges. Then I would be done. Because this, I mean, just take x to be large enough, then a and tau x of a, they depend on different set of edges. OK, I was depending on a box, but I'm, I'm just shifting the box for, I mean, if a depends on this box, tau x of a depends on this one. And then I can use independence. The problem is that it's very easy to convince yourself that any non-trivial event a, which is invariant of the translation, of course, doesn't depend on finitely many edges. So I mean, the start seems already bad. But what you can do is just take b epsilon such that, so an event that depends on finitely many edges, such that the symmetric difference of a with b epsilon is smaller than epsilon. So you know a is an event, in, it's a measurable event. It's an event. So you can approximate it by an event depending on finitely many edges. Just do it. So take B epsilon such that the symmetric difference is smaller than epsilon. Here, if you have the symmetric difference smaller than epsilon, here you can easily convince yourself that this is the probability of B epsilon 
symmetric, I mean, intersected with tau x of b epsilon plus a big O of epsilon, which is probably like smaller than 2 epsilon or something like that. Now, these guys that depend on finitely many edges. So here, you see, I, do, I use this, and I use that if I have that, then I also have the same thing for tau x of a, symmetric difference with tau x of b epsilon. OK? I just use that. And this is just due to the fact that the measure itself is invariant under translations. But here now, this is p epsilon, I mean, p of b epsilon times p of tau x of b epsilon, but you can just replace it by the probability of b epsilon again, plus big O of epsilon. And then here, you use this again to say, OK, this is this probability plus big O of epsilon. You let epsilon tends to 0, and you get your relation. And in fact, all the proof of ergodicity for the percolation type models we are going to work with, they are always based on this type of manipulation. So you won't have independence. So it's going to be a little bit more difficult. But it's basically the same idea. And just I give you the corollary, and we make a break. So the corollary is that uh, the probability that there exists an infinite cluster, well, this thing, because the existence of an infinite cluster is an event which is invariant under translation, this is 1 if p is larger than pc, and 0 if p is smaller than pc. So here there is a sharp change of behavior. Just one thing here, maybe people could have said, yeah, but the, the omega e's they are independent random variables, so you could also use Kolmogorov law here by saying this guy is in the tail, for people who know. For people who don't know, just ignore what I'm saying. It's in the tail sigma algebra, so it's trivial. The thing is that we are going to use this ergodicity for more delicate properties, like the number of infinite clusters or things like that. And then here, the ergodicity, I mean, the ergodicity really is important because uh, these events are not in the tail sigma algebra. OK, break, and we start again in 15 minutes, basically. Now we start with the real proofs. So. Let me give you a proof of the following fact. So here, I mean, maybe you won't realize it, but I think we are entering in like, the next proof is absolutely beautiful from my point of view. And this is typical from the theory. Like, it took very long time to prove this theorem. Very long time. Like, people try for 20 years and actively. And there was a proof, which is actually very interesting, using the free energy by three like, huge guys in our field, like uh, Kesten, Newman, and Eisenman. I mean, if you put the three together, you basically have I mean, every article that were published in the field. One of them was a co-author. And difficult proof, very difficult proof, and uh, applying only to percolation. And one year later, you got Burton and Keane, two guys that are not working in probability whatsoever, and who came up with this beautiful argument. So here I'm going to give you a simplified version of it, because over the years, I, I mean, you, you can see that, in fact, you can simplify even a little bit more. But it's basically the original argument. And the goal is the following. The goal is to prove, well, OK, I have an infinite cluster. Very good. When I have an infinite cluster, how many do I have? And the argument is that, in fact, you have a unique one when it exists. So the probability that, um, so let, we are going to call it E less or equal to 1 be the event that there is 0 or 1 infinite cluster. OK? Or actually, let's call it equal 1 or equal 0. And here, uh, that there is 0 uh, and 1 infinite cluster. OK? 
Well, the probability of E equal 1 belongs to 0, 1. That's the ergodicity. The probability that equal 0 belongs to 0, 1. That's also the ergodicity. But the theorem is the following, that in fact, equal 0 union equal 1 is always 1. It's never more than 1. OK? So there, are, there is at most one infinite cluster, what we call uniqueness of the infinite cluster. So let me try to prove this. So I'm going to define three events. Let's call um, e infinity is going to be uh, the event that there are infinitely many infinite clusters. <laughs> Remember, clusters are, you know, maximal connected components. So I really mean disjoint uh, clusters. Let's call E less than infinity the events that there are finitely many infinite clusters. And let's call E less or equal to 1 the event that there is less than one infinite cluster. Less than or equal. OK. So here I, know, I, I put that, you could put it under parentheses if you want. I could put equal k here, I would get the same result, right? The number, the fact that there are k infinite uh, clusters is exactly an event which is invariant of the translations, so its probability is 0 or 1. And it's exactly an event which is not in the tail sigma algebra, so it's really the ergodicity that tells you that and not Kolmogorov uh, 0, 1 law. So let's start by trying to prove, let's prove that the probability of E less or equal to infinity but E larger or equal to 2, I mean, the fact that there are more than 2, is 0. Let's try to prove that first. So this, you agree, if I can prove that, then the only thing I need to rule out is the fact that there are infinitely many infinite clusters. So let's start by that. And notice that in this thing, if I take a configuration here, well, if I take a large enough box, so I have finitely many infinite clusters. If I take a large enough box, then the box is going to intersect all the infinite clusters, right? So let, so what I'm saying is that this is exactly the union on the n larger or equal to zero of uh, the probability of the event, sorry, that um, lambda n intersects all the infinite clusters. So this guy, this, this guy is exactly that. Okay, if I have infinitely many infinite clusters, of course I'm not in these guys. And if I do have finitely many, I can find a box large enough that I'm intersecting all the infinite clusters. So choose n such that the probability so we are going to, I mean, the, so that the probability that uh, you intersect, that uh, lambda n intersects all uh, the infinite clusters intersected with also this guy. Let's take this and such that this thing is larger or equal to a half of the probability of this guy. OK? Because this guy is the union of that, you can always find n such that the probability that I have my event, and in addition, the box of size n intersects all the clusters, is larger than half the probability of your thing. So do that. OK. Very well. 
But now, if I have that, and I open, so you agree, this thing doesn't depend on the edges in the box of size n. This is an event which I don't need to know what the edges are in the box of size n to know that all the infinite clusters intersect this guy. So, because it's independent in the box of size n, I can open all the edges in the box of size n. So if I open all the edges in the box of size n, I get this thing. So here, this is the probability of having both smaller than infinity, sorry. Probability of having both this and all the edges in the box of size n are open is going to be equal, I mean, larger or equal to that. But if all the, the edges in the box of size n are open and I have that, how many clusters do I have? At most one. Maybe zero, but at most one. So this thing has to be smaller or equal to the probability of this. OK. But now let's look. I mean, either this thing is zero, this thing is zero or one, because it's an event which is invariant under translation. If this guy is zero, then this guy has to be zero. Okay? And if this guy is not zero, it's equal to what? It's equal to one, because it's invariant under translation. And then, well, of course, this thing is yet again zero. OK? So what we use is the fact that, OK, having a certain number and finite number of infinite clusters is something which has probability 0 or 1, but that if I have, say, three of them, if I take a large enough box, they all intersect. And in fact, I can construct a configuration with positive probability, which has only one infinite cluster. But this is contradictory, because if I have three with probability 1, I have one with probability 0. OK? So that's for this part. But notice that I really use the fact that I can find a large enough box that I intersect all the clusters. So it's not going to work at all to rule out the fact that I have infinitely many infinite clusters. So for that, I need a new argument. And that's where the beautiful argument of Burton and Keen kicks in. So Burton and Keen. It's beautiful because it's infinitely simpler than the other argument, but also because it applies to a wide range of models. For the, our other models, we are going to use exactly the same argument. So the burton keen argument is based on the following notion. So definition says that the x in ZD is called a trifurcation if, well, when I remove x, so if, say, x is connected to infinity, and if I remove x, I have exactly three disjoint infinite clusters, I mean, three or more disjoint infinite clusters starting from x. If I remove x, there are at least three disjoint infinite clusters starting from x. Three digit infinite clusters starting from x. So what I mean by that, I have x. I have clusters like that. And if I ignore x, if I just remove it like that, I have three, at least, maybe four, maybe five, maybe 2D, infinite clusters starting from that, disjoint. So that means that this guy, I mean, if I want this guy to be counted differently from this one, they should not be connected to each other. OK? So this is a notion of trifurcation. Is it clear for everybody what I mean by that? Yes? So can we, by, 
can we construct, that, can we prove that a, a point X is a trifurcation with positive probability, in fact? How would we do that? Well, first, we want to have, say, three disjoint infinite clusters getting close to X. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a box large enough. So let's choose N large enough that the probability that lambda n intersects three disjoint infinite clusters. And when I mean intersects three, I mean I don't, I'm not saying that it doesn't intersect more than that, but that this thing is positive. Let's say it's equal to A and it's positive. Okay? So, you, I mean, uh, sorry, is it, I mean, that this thing is larger than, say, one half of the probability of E infinity. You agree E infinity, well, you need to have infinitely many clusters. So there must be a size n where you are going to intersect at least three infinite clusters. So choose n large enough that this happens with probability one half of the probability of your event. OK, let's do that. So now I have this box. And once again, the fact that I intersect three disjoint infinite clusters does not depend on the state of the edges in my box. So I have my first cluster, my second cluster like that, and my third cluster like that. So inside the box, and they do not intersect outside of the box because they do not intersect anyway. So what I'm going to do inside the box is I'm going to construct from 0, I'm going to take one self-avoiding path going to one of the points here, one self-avoiding path going to one of the points here, and one self-avoiding path going to one of the points here. And I'm just going to say, OK, this path is open, this path is open, this path is open, and everything else in the box is closed. OK? If I do that, well, I just constructed a trifurcation at x, at 0. You agree with that? And because for any configuration outside, I just need to change the state of the edges inside the configuration, it only costs me worst case scenario p to the number of open edges in my box, because this is at most the length of my three open path. Of course, it's going to be much, much smaller than that in general. But at worst case scenario, it's p to the number of edges in my box. And I need to close all the others. So worst case scenario, it's going to cost me also 1 minus p to the number of open edges in my box. So with this, with this probability, times p to the number 1 minus p to the number of edges in my box, I just constructed a trifurcation. So this is smaller than the probability that 0 is a trifurcation. So I cheated you really by epsilon here, in the sense that if you think about it and say your three clusters, they are getting exactly here. That starts to be here. You cannot, this guy, you cannot connect it. These three guys need to be disjoint. OK? So if you just get to the corner here, you cannot actually connect them in such a way. So that's the typical exercise that you will see in any classroom uh, of percolation is, what do you do in this case? And basically, the guy explains to you, oh, you know, you, do, you work there, and so on. So first simplification that it's just for you. It's a, a new thing. This is not the way you should solve this problem. <laughs> the way you solve this problem, don't ask for three division clusters. Just ask, OK, you have a certain number of corners. Just ask for the, num the sufficient number of corners, and you are going to just be able to say that there are three, three which do not get to the corners. And then you, are, you solve your problem. So you just say uh, something like, uh, well, OK, now I'm going to humiliate myself by trying to count the number of corners that there is in this thing, but uh, 2D to something, and that's, uh, that's fine. OK, so it's not a real problem. That's the first simplification. 
to prove that the probability of being a trifurcation is strictly positive. What do you do now? OK, let's take a box of size k, or a box of size capital M, and let's count the number of trifurcation in this thing. What is the expected number of trifurcation in this thing? Well, the expected number of trifurcation, so the expected uh, number of trifurcation, is equal to simply the number of vertices in this box times this probability of being a trifurcation. It's just invariance under translations. OK, second uh, simplification in the proof is the following. So look at your configuration inside. So you have a configuration inside your, your set. And do the following inside it. What you are going to do is I'm going to pick the edges one by one in my box. And I'm going to say, if the two endpoints of the edge are already connected without this edge, if I ignore this edge, then I remove it. I just decide it's, in fact, closed. I mean, I don't No, it's just in my mind. I just say, OK, let's ignore this edge. OK? I take the next edge. Now I have a new configuration where I deleted this edge. Maybe, maybe I didn't delete it. If the two endpoints are connected, I remove the edge. And I do that for all the edges here inside this box. What do I get? I get a tree, right? It's going to be a tree inside the box. So this thing of removing the edges is leaving me with a tree. I mean, a forest, I should uh, rather say. Did, could I remove the, I mean, the, verti the trifurcation in my, uh, in my box? They are still there, OK? They are still trifurcation. They are still, in fact, branching point of my tree, right? So I have a tree. I have some branching points like that. So the number of branching points like that is smaller than the number of points on the boundary which are in this tree. Just, you know, this tree has no, I mean, this tree has no, I mean, no leaf. It's really up like that. So all these points are actually the only leaf in my tree. Uh, I should say, sorry, I should say, sorry, you, you delay the edge if the two endpoints are connected to infinity. Sorry, not if they are connected together, if they are connected to infinity, maybe together. So because I want to kill also the, the small guys like that. So I get a tree. These guys are still branching point of the tree. So this is a terrible picture, as you can see. So the trifurcation are still branching point of this thing. There are more branching points than, I mean, less branching point than leaf in my tree. So the trifurcation, they are less than the number of vertices on the boundary of my box. Was I clear? I don't think I was clear. Let me rephrase. Take your configuration. Delete every, as you just go one by one, every edge for which both endpoints are connected to infinity. Am I doing the right thing? No. <laughs> both. What am I doing? If I, if I, yeah, yeah, OK, sorry. If, if both endpoints are connected to infinity without using this edge, I delete this. No, that's not what I want to do. Which uh, point gives you? No, I don't want to do it by, by, uh, by uh, so the standard thing, OK, so this is supposed to be a simplification, which became something more complicated. The standard thing is just to do an induction of the number of trifurcations. But I don't want to do that. I want, well, I'm maybe going to do that, and then next week I will tell you what is the simplification. But um, no, you, you have a way to, uh, so every point like that for which you are not connected to infinity, one of the endpoints is not connected to infinity, you delete it. Every vertex like that. So you are going to only get points for which both endpoints are connected to infinity. And if they are connected to infinity without using this edge, you also delete. Yeah? You delete the 
first delete the uh, edges which are not connected both ways to infinity and then delete the edges the which, which are, are in the same yes, yes, exactly, yes, 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 that was the thing, okay, sorry. So you first delete all the edges which one of the endpoints is not connected to infinity. It gives you only the points for which both endpoints are connected to infinity. Now delete all the edges for which if you remove this edge, the both endpoints are in the same cluster connected to infinity. If you do that, you get a tree. And there, the, the guys, I mean, the trifurcation are still there. So there are fewer than guys on the boundary of your graph, I mean, on the leaf of your graph, which are exactly the guys on the boundary. So you get this bound. And here, by letting n tends to infinity, you see that the probability of 0 being a trifurcation is smaller than this thing divided by this thing. It tends to 0 when n tends to infinity. So the probability of being a trifurcation is 0, but the probability of being a trifurcation is larger than this times a positive constant. So we did use, which is larger than a constant times the probability of e infinity. So this is equal to 0. OK? Sorry for the small mess up there. But observe that this proof uses use very, very little on the graph itself, in fact. I mean, you could imagine doing percolation on something, on a graph which is bigger than just ZD. What is the only thing I use to prove uniqueness of the infinite cluster? I just use that I can find boxes for which the boundary, the size of the boundary, is much smaller than the volume of my, uh, of my graph, of my box. So this is a property of what we call amenable graphs. So in fact, here you have a very nice description of amenable graph and in, par in particular amenable groups, which is that you are going to always get uniqueness of the infinite cluster for these guys. And that's actually sharp because if you take non-amenable groups, you expect that there is a phase where you will have infinitely many infinite clusters. So this was a parenthesis, and this is the end of this proof, which I think is a beautiful piece of mathematics. And you are going to see we are going to use it extensively in marginal contexts because the proof is very robust, in fact. OK. Now we get to another point. So basically, we describe, we know we have from 0 to 1, we have, we have some PC. Above, you have an infinite cluster. In fact, it's a unique infinite cluster. Below, what do you have? Well, you have no infinite cluster. But maybe the first question, I mean, the second question you want to ask is, OK, so 0 is connected to boundary of box of size n with probability tending to 0, but at which speed? And in fact, the theorem is the following. The speed is exponentially fast. Theorem, which is due to Menshikov and to Eisenman and Barsky. And that's the following. It says. For any d larger or equal to 2, for any p smaller than pc, there exists a constant, strictly positive, such that the probability that 0 is connected to the boundary of the box of size n is smaller than exponential of minus cn. So it decays exponentially fast. And I'm really here, I should be very careful about the fact that I really want you to see that this is strictly less than pc. <coughs> we are going to see something completely different at criticality. So this theorem is going to help you describe everything you want on the subcritical phase. Because once you have that, you can do a lot of things. There are a few examples in the, uh, in the, the exercise uh, sheet, which, I mean, this is really the first theorem you want to prove on this, uh, on this uh, subcritical phase. So these two proofs, Menshikov and Eisenman barsky they are both beautiful, and, uh, but they are also pretty tough. So I'm going to present a new proof, which is, due, I mean, which is one year old, which is a little bit simpler than that, I think. 
And today I will not have time to completely uh, describe it, but I'm going to start at least. And let's start by a definition. So let's a notation rather than a definition. So let S be a subset of ZD. Okay. And I'm going to define delta S. It's going to be the edge boundary of this set. So it's a set of edges x, y with x in S and y not in S. I'm going to just, because it's going to be simpler, I'm going to always assume x in S, y not in S, even though here, of course, I could change. But the, the notation is going to be simpler like that. So this is the first thing. And let me. Let me define something that is going to look strange for you at first, but you are going to see in a minute why it's a nice quantity. Let's define phi p of s. It's going to be the sum, I mean p, times the sum for all the edges x, y in delta s of the probability of 0 connected to x in s. So here, I mean, people usually tell me oh, it's a little bit strange because why are you summing on x and y? So first, I'm summing on x, y in delta s because I want x to be on the boundary of my set s. So my set s may have holes. I'm fine with that. And it may also not be connected. I'm also fine with that. So 0 is here. So I want always x to be in my set, but on the boundary that it's connected to an edge which is not in my set. And the second thing I want to do, because it's going to be nice in the thing, I want y, I want to count x with multiplicity somehow. I want to count it several times if it's connected to several edges outside my box. It's going to be useful. OK. So first, first proposition, and that's where you see that S is useful, is that if there exists S included in uh, ZD finite containing 0 such that phi p of s is strictly smaller than 1, then, well, then in fact I have exponential decay. Then there exists c positive such that the probability that 0 connected to the boundary of the box of size n is smaller than e to the minus c. So if you, I mean, a way of seeing that is to, to think, well, S is some kind of witness already that I am in this phase where I have exponential decay. For instance, take S to be just a singleton 0. What is phi p of S? Well. The boundary here is just all the edges incident to 0. So x is always 0. So 0 is automatically connected to 0. So this thing is 1. So I'm just summing the number of edges, which is 2d. So I'm just saying phi p of 0 is 2d times p. And I already told you earlier that, OK, if 2d times p is smaller than 1, probability of having a path of length n is going to decay exponentially fast because it's smaller than 2dp to the n. So here is just a generalization of that to any set S, any finite set S. So let's try to prove that. And you know, it's, I think it's, it's kind of a, a cute story because maybe just a historical remark. Phi p, not exactly phi p, but something looking like phi p was actually introduced in the second paper on percolation by Harris, where he introduced that just for the box of size n, for s equals the box of size n. 
And he was exactly saying, the, exactly doing the argument I'm going to do, which is if the expected number of points on the boundary of my box of size n connected to 0 is smaller than 1, then I have exponential decay. That was the second paper on percolation. There were like maybe 1,000 papers in between, uh, between physics, math, uh, computer science, and so on. In between this paper and the proof of the final proof of exponential decay by Menshikov and Eisenman Barsky. And in fact, the idea that you are going to see the proof is going to be very simple once we have this thing, the idea that led to, uh, that leads to the proof of exponential decay was already there in the second paper. So it's a very cute, um, so read old papers, that's my point. Then forget about it and one day maybe it's going to come back like, oh my god, that's a good idea. <laughs> this guy was smart. Okay, so what, how do we prove this proposition? Just look, let's imagine, so let's first say that uh, S is included in lambda k. Let's fix k such that like the radius of your, uh, your, your set S. And now let's look at the following. Imagine that zero is connected to the boundary of the box of size n times k. Let's imagine that. So zero is connected by an open path to the box of size n times k. By the way, zero is connected by an open path, very good. But this path has to leave first the box of size k, but therefore it also has to leave the set S. Right? It has to leave the set S. Maybe it, it leaves it and maybe it comes back. Why not? Okay. Maybe, I mean, if I look at the cluster of zero in this box of size, uh, maybe I should do a bit of a, a bigger box. So this is a set, the set S. Zero is here. I know I'm connected to the boundary. If you look at the cluster of zero in this thing, so let's look at the cluster of zero in this thing, in, in the set S. Maybe the guy is also looking like that, and so on. But there is one point that has to be connected. There is one point, if I define C to be the cluster of zero in S, well, you can really convince yourself that there is a point X, which is some kind of the last guy in this cluster before I reach the box of size nk. There is a last point and it's connected to a first point outside y in such a way that zero, so there exists an edge xy in delta s such that x is connected to zero in s and in fact even in c, but this is the same as in s. <coughs> such that the edge xy is open and such that y is connected to the box of size nk but outside c, not using the edges in c. So in zd minus c. So I let you try to convince yourself that this is true. I like to see it by going from the outside. You, go, you, you, you take your set, you take the set c and now you go from the outside, you explore everything from the outside, and at some point you should connect to this set because you assume that zero is connected to, uh, to the boundary of your box. So first time you hit, you hit at x and the point just before was y. So you always have that. Okay, so if I have that, I can... Excuse me, why x is connected to, to zero to c? So it's connected to zero in S, right? That's, but, but it's therefore also in C because C is exactly the cluster of zero in S. So it's the set of points which are connected to zero. Oh, so it doesn't mean that we have a path from X, X to zero in C, but it No, no, it, it, it means that as well. You see, I mean, here it's saying you have a path from zero to X in S, okay? An open path. 
but every vertex of this open path is connected to zero in S. So it is in C. So this is really exactly equivalent that you can write this thing if you prefer. But let's, let's, let's write it like that. OK, let's write it like that. What I want to say is that if I condition on S, this event and this event, do, uh, if I condition on C, this event and this event are independent of what, of what is happening in C. So that's what I'm going to use. I'm going to say, well, first, maybe let me simplify that. Let me first say, this event, this event, and this event, as defined like that, you agree that they occur disjointly. They occur disjointly, these three events. Because here, I only need to check the edges between vertices in C. Here, I only need to check the edge x, y. Y is not in, uh, in S, so it's definitely not one of these edges. And here, I only need to check the edges which are not in C, or at least with one endpoint outside of C. So these three events, they occur disjointly. So if I use the BK inequality, I'm going to have that the product of the three, I mean, the probability of the intersection of these guys is smaller than the product of the probabilities. I don't want to use the BK inequality because, once again, we didn't prove it. And it's a little bit more uh, complicated to prove than this proof, so <laughs> it would be too bad. So let me just do another way, like go around this BK inequality to show to you that most of the case you can do without it. So what I'm going to do is the following. So I say probability that 0 is connected to the boundary of the box of size nk. Well, this is smaller we call to the sum over the edge x, y in uh, delta s of the probability of these three things. So I want 0 connected to x in s. I want x, y open. And I want y connected to the boundary of the box of size nk in the complement of c. That's important. Now let's decompose on C. So let's just you know, say, OK, it's the sum of all possible sets C, the sum of every x, y in delta S, of the probability of these three things. But I'm going to add also, OK, C is equal to C. I'm also telling you the cluster is exactly equal to that. So this is a partition of this event. So I can do like that. This is an equality. C is a subset of uh, S. Yeah, C is a subset of S. But you see, you don't even need to say it, because if it's not, this thing is going to be, I mean, the pro this event is empty. So this thing is going to be 0. So you don't even need to specify it, but you are right. C is automatically an event of S, which contains 0, for instance. But this, you don't need. OK, now. What I see is the following. So it's the same sum C, the same x, y in delta S. Here, let's see. Ma now that I fix, I really fix the set C. So C is some set, like, I mean, some subset C. What are the different events depending on? What are the edges that these guys are depending on? So the second one is depending only on the edge x, y. The third one, now, because I know that c is equal to c, this small c is fixed, these guys are only depending on edges with both endpoints not in c. So this is only depending. So this is depending on edge x, y. This is depending on edges with I mean, both endpoints not in C, OK? I don't even need, if one of the endpoints is in C, I don't need to check this edge, because I don't need to, I mean, I will not be, it will not help me being connected not using any vertex in C. And these two guys, this guy and this guy, well, this guy is depending only on edges which are uh, in C, so between two vertices of C. And this guy depends on what? It depends on all the edges with one endpoint in C. 
because I need to check all the I need to check all the open edges, but I also need to check it's not a bigger set than just C. So I need to check that every edge which has one endpoint in C and one outside is closed. Right? But at the end, you agree that these two guys, this guy and this guy, they depend on different set of edges. So now I can just use independence. So this is equal to the probability, I'm almost done, don't worry, of 0 connected to x in S C equals C times the probability of the edge x1 open times the probability of this last thing, which is y connected in C complement. I can fix it like that, of lambda and k. OK, so this is just independence. OK, so let's put this guy on the I mean, So first, this, this is what? This is p. Then I'm going to just exchange the two sums, so x, y in delta s. Then I have the sum over c of this event. Because I'm partitioning, this is a partition on, of this event. So this sum over c of this thing, this is what? This is just the probability of 0 connected to x in s. Nothing more. So what is the, and then the last guy is probability that y is connected to the boundary of the box of size nk in C complement. Well, y is on the boundary, y is in this box, you agree, in the box of size k. So if it's in the box of size k, if y is connected to the boundary of the box of size nk, in the complement of C, so of course here if you remove this, you increase the event, okay, because you are just saying there are more possibilities of being connected. And if y is connected there, y has to be connected to distance n minus 1 times k. So this thing is smaller than the probability of 0 being connected to the box of size n minus 1 times k. This first term is just, you recognize phi p of s. The second term is this guy. And now you see what, what we have done. We have just expressed the probability of 0 being connected to n times k. It's smaller than something, I mean, it's smaller than something smaller than 1 times the probability of being connected to distance n minus 1 times k. You iterate that and you get phi p of s to the n as a bound. But phi p of s is smaller than 1. OK? Heuristically, I mean physically, you can see that as follows. Like It really costs you something to get outside of s. And once you are outside of s, you still need to go and you still need to pay the same cost to get outside of this translate of s that is centered on you. And then you do it again and again and again. And, every, and you need to do that at least n times. OK? Well, that's the end of, uh, of this, this uh, lecture. So notice that now I can define just, maybe just I define one guy and, and we stop. I can define PC tilde to be the infimum of the P such that phi P of S is larger or equal to 1 for any S containing 0 and finite. OK? If I define this guy, I know that for any p smaller than pc tilde, there is a s such that this guy is smaller than 1. So I have exponential decay. So if I want to prove my theorem, what do I need to prove? I need to prove that this pc tilde is in fact pc. So what I'm going to do next time is I'm going to take p larger than pc tilde and prove to you that there is an infinite cluster at this p. And I will be done with that. OK? Um, two things for the guy from the master class. I'm going to send you an email right now with the, um, the different um, articles. So take a look, and we can discuss next week 
the repartition of this. Maybe if you could do the following, that would be perfect. Prepare some ranking, like, I don't know, your three favorite articles. And like that, we will try to do a repartition, which is because maybe you all want to do the same. <laughs> I was very careful not to put the names of the guys that are in charge of the thing. But there is just one paper which is already, I think Bazok is already taking care of his article, but the others, you can choose them. And uh, that was one thing. What was the other thing? I'm not distributing uh, the, the exercise because I am. And he had a hard time doing them. So, I mean, not doing the exercise, the, the, the exercise sheet. Okay, thank you very much. Have a nice weekend and uh, see you next week.